My name is Morba Ja, and I'm an aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics professor at the University of Texas at Austin, where I lead a transdisciplinary research program in space safety, security, and sustainability. And I've partnered with spacewatch.global to start a new series of web talks, cafes, space cafes called Morba's Vox Populi, which is Latin for people's voice. So I hope to see you there. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be candid conversations about all sorts of stuff related to space safety, security, and sustainability. I am a space watcher. I'm Thorsten Greening, producer today, technical hand and publisher of spacewatch.global. We're Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters and our Space Cafe podcast. We also opened our fan shop online where you can support us actively and become a space watcher. Edition 1 has awesome merchandising products for you, your friends and the ones you love. Your support is needed to keep our work alive for you. I can't repeat it enough, but we need your support for what we do for you. And if you missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our website in the event section and on YouTube. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to hand over to your host today, Professor Moribaja. Over to you, Moriba. Perfect. Um, I wanted to say uh, thanks to everybody for, for joining us uh, uh, today uh, from all across the globe. Uh, welcome to the second session of uh, the Space Cafe Morbus Vox Populi. We have very uh, great panelists um, that are with us today. And, you know, the theme that we're going to try to uh, concentrate the, the conversation is around this idea of you know, what's normalcy in space and this idea of norms of behavior. I mean, I've, I've heard about this uh, for many years, uh, you know, normalcy in space. What does that even mean? Uh, you know, I, I'm not even sure what that means and hopefully we'll be able to uh, discuss that a little bit with you today. And then this idea of, uh, you know, norms of behavior. I can, I can say this, right? When it comes to near Earth space, I think uh, you know we can all agree that it's a finite resource. Um, you know, we don't put things just anywhere in Earth orbit. We put things into very specific orbital highways, and many of the things on these orbital highways uh, don't come back um, uh, for a very, very long time. And, and some things in low Earth orbit uh, uh, do, depending on the altitude, but still it takes time for that to happen. Things above uh, low Earth orbit uh, don't for, for very, very long times or ever. And, um, you know, as opposed, to, as opposed to things on highways on the Earth, where when things run out of uh, propulsion, things come to a, a halt because of friction and these sorts of things, right? On these orbital highways, things keep on going at the speeds uh, at which they died. Uh, and so there's, there's growing traffic. Um, it seems like we don't have standard rules for the traffic uh, in Earth orbit. We have a new space race, uh, people launching as many satellites as quickly as possible and even though there are no deeds, uh, there are no titles for property in Earth orbit, pretty much once you, you know, physics tells us that two things can't occupy the space, the same space at the same time because, uh, you know, bad things happen. And so um, I've also thought about this in terms of the current pandemic, uh, right, where just like we see this pandemic kind of spreading, and, and people talking about flattening the curve on, on COVID-19, how do we flatten the curve on the growth of uh, the debris population, right? Um, we do have these uh, super spreader events uh, on earth with, with, with regards to COVID-19. Uh, we have potential super spreader events on orbit with large masses, rocket bodies that could explode or uh, you know, if they're collided against by something, then th these things spread 
uh, as it were, uh, lots of debris uh, into these orbital highways. Um, and you know, one of the one of the issues uh, that just like here on Earth with with the pandemic, right? People who aren't social distancing, who aren't wearing the masks, the equivalent with regards to the debris population is people just not complying uh, with guidelines that people have agreed upon that makes sense. Um, and the level of compliance, how do people interpret these things? Is, is interpretation of this stuff common you know, uh, across these instruments? The answer is, of course not, right? Because we all come from different cultures and have a different way of looking at things. So you know, when we talk about this, we also see geopolitical wrestling uh, uh, in Earth orbit. We hear things about, oh, the United States and the Space Force, and oh, the Russians like park next to my satellite, even though parking next to it, you know, means like 100 kilometers away, which I got to tell you, that's not that close in my opinion, but that makes some people uncomfortable. So these sorts of things, it's very much this he said, she said, uh, interpreting these behaviors in a, a variety of ways. And, um, you know, back to this idea of the space race, you know, we're, we're tracking about, you know, 26,000 objects, you know, 3,000 or so are working, everything else is, is not. Talking about doubling the size of this uh, catalog with operational satellites just in low Earth orbit. And uh, I have to tell you, this is the textbook definition of a complex system, if there ever was one. Uh, not that it's all chaotic. There is probably structure uh, in you know, the behavior of stuff up there, but you have a myriad of participants making decisions in the absence of knowing how other participants are deciding stuff. That can't be a great recipe uh, for, for uh, you know, maintaining a semblance of sustainability long-term and these sorts of things. So this is really what I want to bring forward as the impetus for this discussion today. And so today I'm, I'm very pleased to say that uh, again, we have our panelists, we have uh, Dr. Regina Peltzas from the DLR, we have Jenny Tapio from Finland, we have Charity Whedon who's uh, representing uh, uh, AstroScale and we have Professor Thomas Schildnick from the University of Bern. And so uh, given what I just said, I guess I would like to open it up to, to any one of you. What are your opinions or your thoughts with regards to either uh, normalcy? What, is it, what, is normal, what does normal behavior in space even mean? What's your understanding of it? Do we need to know and define and understand this stuff? And then two, when it comes to norms of behavior, we've heard this for a while. Do we ever think that we're going to get there? And if so, what might be the path to that? So I'd like to open that up to any one of the panelists who'd like to step in and say something. I could kick it off, would you like Mariba? Yeah, please. Sure, okay. Um, so, well, first of all, uh, what is normal? That's a very important question. And as we kick off this podcast, um, normal is being able to talk to each other in person. <laughs> um, we've missed out on a lot of the, the trade shows and the conference experiences and cornering each other and, and debating these things. So I'm trying to get into that mode of, I see Mariba and I see all these other panelists and um, in the hallway of uh, IAC and say, let's talk about something. So let me get in that mode. Um, there are already norms of behavior in space and they're decades old. Uh, the norm is to pollute. The norm is to uh, throw away uh, your spacecraft and don't worry about it. It won't hit anything. That is the norm. What we have to do is change <laughs> from that state of mind into a new state of mind where it is a limited resource. Clean space is a limited resource. Um, thinking decades ago, it was normal to pollute, you know, dump in a river or, in a lake that, you know, so what? And then we realized there's a big problem here and then changed our tune. So today, um, if someone, you know, gives you a glass bottle or a plastic bottle and says, no, oh, go put that in the garbage for me. Um, and there's no recycle bin. I know I would be like, ah, I can't do this. <laughs> you know, I feel it. I'm like, this isn't normal. We got to get into that mode. It used to be normal just to throw your bottles into the trash. Um, and so I, I feel the space community hasn't uh, gotten to that stage 
to trade what was formerly normal into some new futuristic and modern def definition of what's normal in space. And yes, it's a little more complicated. You got to know more. You got to be transparent and talk to your orbital neighbors. Um, you got to, you know, potentially recycle and get your stuff out of the way uh, after end of life. Uh, so that those are kind of high level thoughts of we already have a normal that's changed into a new normal, a new normal that can sustain ourselves in the future. Thanks, Charity. Yeah, Thomas. Uh, yeah, I would just like to throw something into the, this round here. You know, normal. I mean, to me, it's normal to shake your hand when I'm, you know, when I'm meeting you. But norm is, is something, what is normal? I mean, that's something which is related to um, culture. Yeah. Uh, it's related to many other things. You know, I mean, what's normal in space? It might be related to your technical capabilities. It might be related to your way of operations, you know, things you, you think it, it's normal. I mean, as a physicist, I would say, or an astronomer, astrophysicist, I would say, hey, it, it's the physics, which is normal. But um, it's not as easy as that, I think. So I don't think we have a single thing which is normal in space. <laughs> it depends on the operators. It depends on the culture. It depends on technology and so on and so forth. But, but I fully agree. I mean, what we are doing right now, most of what we are doing is similar to what we have been uh, doing here on Earth uh, 50 years ago, throwing things away without caring about the... Uh, um, Yeah, Regina. Yeah, I want to pick up um, these two points. I think it's a really interesting question. And I think you've, you've both highlighted how, A, it's depending on culture, also professional cultures, um, national cultures, organizational cultures. And at the same time, it's also norms are not necessarily something that's cut in stone, legally binding that we have, but it's something, as Charity highlighted, it's something that we develop as we go along. And um, right now we've got something, like you say, we've been... We've had this uh, behavior that's been going on for, for, for a long time or the way maybe our sense of, um, you know, not having an, enough foresight to really imagine, for instance, that one day we will be at the cusp of, of a transformation that we'll see uh, tens of thousands of assets that, you know, we didn't think about this uh, 30 or 50 years ago. We thought there's going to be a few assets and they will have time to avoid each other or they will not even be close to each other at all. And um, at the same time as... Um, as, as Moriba highlighted, we've got this uh, complex system now. And the, the interesting thing is when we face complexity in, you know, in our everyday lives, you just mentioned it, you know, when we, when we meet people, how close is too close? I think this, this uh, idea came up sometimes, you know, how do you even deal this when, when you're just meeting another person? I think that's a really interesting um, point because we are emerging this type of behavior in orbit at the moment. So if you feel someone is getting too close, you communicate that either directly to them or you're broadcasting it out uh, at some point into, into the world and say, look, this is happening and I, I don't really like it. But what, what we're going to see, um, especially if we've got a huge number of assets, is that they don't necessarily talk to each other. That they're machines. They don't, like human beings, have an, some kind of internal heuristic or a rule of thumb to gauge okay I don't really like this or this this is maybe not normal but I don't mind anyway you know we, we really we need those type of um, this kind of exchange and these rules to imbue um, our proxies which are uh, space assets with these rules because they don't care they don't care if they collide they don't they don't care if they get too close and the more autonomy we will see in these type of uh, Assets, the, the more complex that we'll get. And, and we, we need all kinds of different roles from avoiding traffic, you know, on the technical side, like TCAS, down to, you know, how do we talk to each other? I'll leave it at that. No, I think, I think that's great, Regina. Jenny, do you have anything you'd like to add to this? Or? Sure, just uh, from the sort of like legal side, of course, I mean, it's not that we don't have norms of behavior as well existing already currently. And I'm myself, for example, of the opinion that the Outer Space Treaty already does set certain principles that are very applicable to our discussion here as well. I mean, the entire notion of, of responsibility that's really embedded within, and as well the idea that uh, there are freedoms, but those freedoms are not absolute. Those freedoms are such that you need to take into account the freedom of others. So 
when you are exercising your freedom, it cannot imp impede someone else exercising, exercising their freedom. So I don't think that um, uh, it's a, a, a vacuum where we wouldn't have the norms of behavior. What might be the, the issue that, of course, those are at principle level and those are applicable to states. And there is a, an activity required from the states, like a deliberate choice to make those binding at national uh, level, uh, the treaty obligations, but as well, like when we are t discussing sustainability now, the guidelines that we have, for example, developed within uh, the United Nations uh, COPUOS, those need to be implemented at national level and their states, of course, are in a key position uh, to do that. No, I think, I think that's, that's great input. Um, you know, just going along with what you're saying in terms of implementation, uh, you know, I've started uh, taking a look at how nation states implement, say, the uh, UN Convention on, on, on Space Object Registry. And, you know, it, it, says, it says there, you know, register your objects as soon as is practicable. Um, and I can tell you that the, the data show that that's there are wide variations in what as soon as it's practicable is. People that might register their objects in within the first 90 to 120 days and other people is, you know, consistently two to three years uh, after the fact the thing is on orbit. Um, so so I, think, I think even when it comes to the implementation, clearly that's not, uh, you know, standardized and, and uh, you know, what's normal when it comes to how people are interpreting and implementing um, you know, the, these sorts of things. I want to, I want to, I want to, uh, go to the Q and a just to make sure that we're getting to, uh, some of the, uh, audience here. And, um, let's see. Uh, so, so there's this person, Jurassimos, uh, uh, Torsten, I don't know if, 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 if we can get Jurassimos to, to, to come online and he can just, uh, ask his question directly. He's allowed to talk. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Pleasure is ours, man. <laughs> nice to talk to you, Moriba. Uh, I have a question for the panelists, and it goes like this. Do you sense, do you, do you feel that there's a difference of the perception of normalcy between the old space players, the old space actors, and the new ones? Uh, so my point is, do we think that the new space actors are going after money and they don't care about the norms and the environment, space environment, and the older guys are much more careful? Thank you. Yeah, who wants to take that one? I'm not going to take it. Um, I'll take it. Um, so I, I don't think we can paint um, generationally uh, satellite operators. I think everyone's very much aware of the issue, especially in LEO. I will say that more traditional uh, operators in the geostationary orbit have had decades of experience um, and very expensive satellites that they have uh, an economic pressure on them to maintain that environment. And the geo belt obviously is a very limited resource. So I feel there might be good lessons learned in how geo operators share data. Space Data Association, its, its origins might be an interesting um, you know, way to look at this of, of the geo operators starting out by sharing of, um, data amongst themselves and then expanding that to other operators. So I, I feel we can't uh, paint new versus old, that that's not fair. And uh, in fact, everyone's very much aware of the issue and it comes down to, you know, how can they implement it economically? Cool, anybody, yeah, go ahead, Thomas. Uh, I'm not so sure uh, if everybody is really aware of and if everybody is really, you know, committed to, because if, if you do the math, simply if you do the math as an operator who is going to operate for the next 10 years a satellite, you would say my main risk comes from the launch, comes from technology. I have 80% reli reliability for my spacecraft, my risk to get hit by, you know, something else, hmm, minor. So I think where it comes from, and especially for, for, the, uh, for the traditional operators, 
is as well, you know, that, that the naming and shaming for many, many years that you should deorbit to the graveyard in geo, you should. And if you don't, I mean, we were pointing with fingers and uh, I think the new commercial operators, many of the big ones at least, they, they really want to be the good guys, you know? They cannot afford to be the bad guys polluting things. It's not because they care so much or because they are so nice to humanity or to guys like me who care about long-term sustainability. I don't think this is really the case. And the other point which I wanted to add to the discussion, you know, norms of behavior, if I'm going coming too close to you, my question would be, what is the goal of all of that? Is it because you are scared because of my possible intention? Or is it simply because we want to make sure that we can safely travel on these roads? We want to make sure that we can do that in 10 years from now. And I think that's really making a big difference, you know, trying to, yeah, to uh, infer intent is something totally different from trying to make travel on these roads safe. No, that's a good point, Jenny, yeah. Just quickly to, to react on that question, I think it's very good to, it was a very nice question because while there might be different opinions within that group and, and different interests, I think one common interest for, for all the actors uh, where, where the interests converge is that the, the orbits need to remain usable so that the usability of the outer space is a common concern for all those named actors here as well, be that new space or, or traditional space or, or governmental actors. And of course, the risks uh, are also a bit shared as well between, let's say, when we talk about companies and states, because obviously states have that international responsibility and liability with also within the interest of the states at the level of authorization to check that the risks are as much mitigated as possible because it's quite difficult to mitigate them afterwards. I mean, just due to physical realities as well, but just to, to comment. No, absolutely. Regina? Yeah, yeah just uh, one thought on, I was gonna say something about misperceptions, but maybe that can um, that can come in a little bit later, but um, I wanna go back to um, one of the, one part of the question on, you know, the different interests and how we, you know, are new actors only after one thing? And I think um, Charity already pointed out that they, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, responsible, um, there's a lot of responsibility that uh, different actors have. And um, we, regardless of where we come from and what our actual reason for being in orbit is, you know, whether we want to um, sell bandwidth or we want to uh, look look at something or we, we are just there to, because we want to, you know, we're, we're learning about uh, the environment. Uh, they, they're all completely different interests and we trade them off, but the overall value in um, that we want to see is um, the safety and uh, the sustainable, uh, sustainability of orbit. And I think that can go in hand in hand, but I don't think it's easy. And I don't think it's something that we can gloss over because for instance, um, uh, from, from our perspective, um, I, I work at a space agency and I'm seconded for a while to a Ministry of Economy. So our lens is looking at how can we facilitate in a responsible and, uh, and sustainable way the commercial use of, of space. Um, if we are, you know, like other domains, like, uh, you know, there's uh, commercial activity in the seas, like, just like there is uh, scientific activity. So there's lots of different interests. And I think the, the, the challenge is to trade them off and come out with this overarching value of, you know, having orbit safe and usable in the long run. No, I, I, I thank you. I think, I think that's, that's um, you know, very meaningful what, what you said. One of the things that I've been thinking about as the discussion has been kind of progressing and also looking at the questions is that, um, and back to what Thomas uh, had said about the physics and whatnot, um, anything related to, so a couple of things, um, one, Things related to the physics, uh, because that is scientific, we can say that that knowledge is fairly accessible, fairly fairly common uh, uh, across uh, the globe. But the implementation 
of things back to what Thomas said with how people operate, that is very individualized, right? And so the implementation of the knowledge is very individualized, even if some of that knowledge is common. And I can, I can say this, um, you know, it's back to us not really knowing everybody's decision-making criteria for safety, you know, what makes them feel uncomfortable? When do they want to get out of the way? How, 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 how much anticipation before some, some predicted time of closest approach is, is their threshold for making decisions? So that's not very much like understood across uh, all the operators, which I think is, is an issue. But getting, back, getting to the uh, you know, security piece with how close is too close and that sort of stuff, you know, I've heard several people say, oh, well, we should just come up with a standard, uh, you know, this many kilometers is like the keep out zone. And the thing that I tell them is, you know, coming up with, even if you say it's, you know, this many kilometers away, there's an uncertainty around that. And, and not everybody has the same level of precision, right? Some people might be able to say, oh, yeah, I know where I'm at, you know, plus or minus several meters. Other people that may not have uh, anything to rely upon except what the U.S. provides or whatever might say, hey, my uncertainty is like 10 kilometers. And so um, it's back to, and I think, Regina, this goes into the uh, misconceptions and that sort of stuff, misinterpretations, and how do we, how do we guard ourselves uh, a, a against this sort of stuff? So um, um, anyway, b before, before you get to that, I just want to look, look at this really quick. And I see that um, let's see what well, car has a question about, uh, you know, steps to contest a norm of behavior. So may, maybe, maybe if we could let Wakar on and, and let Wakar kind of, uh, throw this directly. He's yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm here. Thank you for, for letting me ask my question. Um, yeah. So really something that I've been exploring uh, in the last several months is uh, like really asking myself, how do you contest a norm of behavior? What's the steps that you have to take? And if uh, one country is saying, um, yeah, I'm gonna, I, I don't think that you're following this norm of behavior, what's the source of data that they're using? And maybe, maybe um, address that because then everybody's gonna have to have their own independent source. Cool, anybody? <laughs> wow, okay, 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 go, go let, let's go. Jenny, I saw Jenny's hand first. I'll, I'll be brief. Just that um, one thing that might help there is the sort of like the lawyer's point of view where you approach a question that what is a norm of behavior from the point of view that whether it's a, a, a legally binding norm, whether it's a, a non-legal uh, norm where you don't have the possibility of enforcement. So there, the traditional means of public governance through law have a distinct, distinct advantage of being enforceable that you can actually, once you there, there is a uh, norm identified that will be uh, applied and that can be enforced. But with these norms of behavior, once they belong to the group of others, there's, first of all, they are very different from one another. You can have policy norms or you can have technical norms and you don't have this capability of enforcement without, uh, the, the, let's say, the help of law through uh, national implementation. Nice. So, yeah, that's a really sticky question, Wakar. <laughs> Good one. Um, so I was thinking, you know, it depends if it's two private operators from the same country, I mean, you can get regulators involved, you can talk to each other, it's, it's fairly straightforward, I feel. But if it's two different uh, country operators, um, you know, that, that requires a whole different level of dialogue to, you know, call out that is a norm or not a norm. Take, for example, um, the, the, the Russian test, I think it was last summer, and the US stood up and said, this is, this is not okay and its allies stood up and tweeted out, this is not okay. I see that as a tactic, um, gaining allied support or a, a small coalition to help bring your argument forward that, yeah, we declare this is not normal. So just offering that for thought. Very cool. Anybody else have, okay, go ahead, Thomas. I think again, it comes back to, you know, what we attach to that term normal you know, what is normal behavior? Is it because somebody has been approaching somebody else 
in the sense that this is, was, let's say, risk for a collision, or I did something in space, I had my two own assets, and I approached with one, the other one, which, cool, to a certain extent, it's normal. We are doing this uh, all the time with the space station, but because that might be a test for whatever. And that's what I mean with inferring further intentions. Are we talking about that? You know, are we talking about intentions or, you know, things like that? I, I know that's related with, with security. Or are we talking simply about the rules on the road? Uh, so, and I think that's where a lot of the confusion is coming from, actually. <laughs> and that's a, why we are, you know, not sharing the data, why we are not transparent in what we are going to do or what we are doing, because the key is going to be transparency. I mean, if we will have any of these norms in future, I will have to announce a maneuver in advance, for example, in order to make all the other ones aware, hey, I'm going to turn left like I'm doing on a cross, on a crossing, you know, without, I mean, I'm not giving away any, you know, I'm not telling what my intention is. I just want to turn left, that's all. And uh, I think that's where a lot of the problems come from because that is that whole mix of, of things, you know, safety, security, intention. Uh, if, if, you know, if, if I'm doing something, it's not the same as if the other is doing something like a simple, uh, a simple proximity operation maneuver with my own assets, let's say. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, okay, yeah, I think, yeah, I think um, one part of the question also um, referred to, you know, what resources do you use? And I think that brings up this um, beautiful, very challenging problem of, you know, whose data do you trust? If, uh, if you have two types of data, which one is the, you know, SSA data from, from uh, ground-based or space-based sensors, which uh, data do you trust? So I think there's a number of really interesting initiatives in, um, in uh, you know, pooling this type of data. There are scientific approaches to this. There are uh, uh, operator approaches to this. In Europe, we have uh, European space surveillance and tracking where uh, different member states come together and fuse sensor data. But the, the question is always, um, which data do you trust? And I think the more of a multilateral effort, effort we have in exchanging um, data and uh, you know, as, as far as we can, there's always, you know, this, this bit of, uh, of, of uh, you know, security, security related and sensitive um, aspects that uh, will, will, you know, not be disclosed for the foreseeable future, but the, we should share as much as we can. And we have already uh, some wonderful fora for this who've been, you know, uh, gaining traction in the last few years and, and sometimes in decades. So, so this is, we, we need that type of thing because for sure, if you really want to attribute intent, intent, you will need some a very very robust uh, database for that, a base of you know information and, and you know you don't want to make decisions or and take action, especially not if we're talking such a fragile settings, uh, such in space, uh, if if you don't have a robust uh, and corroborated base for this. Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I think I think that's good. I think. Uh... Uh, you know, some of what Wakar is getting to is uh, even utilizing things like blockchain and bringing these sorts of technologies in to, to help with that, which I think makes a lot of sense. One of the things that I want to uh, post to everybody here, um, we got a lot, lots of questions. Clearly, we're not going to be able to get to all of them, and this is just the way uh, this goes, but a lot, lot of questions from the audience. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about in terms of sustainability and managing this kind of, uh, you know, ecosystem, uh, orbital ecosystem more holistically is this idea of, of just like there's, uh, you know, carrying capacity for ecosystems and even carrying capacity for highways. Um, do you, you know, what are your thoughts on, um, and I know that the European Space Agency, uh, you know, the folks at ESOC came up with a, a definition of like, you know, orbital capacity and stuff. To what extent, um, do you feel that we should probably have a global uh, concept or definition of the carrying capacity of any given orbit? And um, if we can uh, get to that sort of sustainability metric, could we then have something like the, I, you know, just like the ITU uh, manages spectrum, have something that manages this carrying capacity where the capacity is, let's say, least 
uh, to to some entity for some amount of time and th and that sort of stuff. Does does this whole carrying capacity idea, you know, to what extent does it make sense? Is that something that is achievable and 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 how useful would that be to help manage this uh, uh, you know ecosystem um, you know jointly? Any thoughts? Um, so carrying capacity is, is, you know, it's, it thinks in a holistic term, right? It's not thinking the United States has this level of capacity and right. Europe has this and et cetera. And in, in there lies the problem is because right now we, we don't want to prevent other nations from launching, uh, you know, freedom of access to space, et cetera. So I, I see this as a huge issue. Uh, if there ever were to be um, someone to declare, you know, this orbit is full, um, I think there's <laughs> a huge difficulty uh, either from the ITU or, or just from other nations that want to launch into that same orbit because they are clearly free to. Um, and, and so that's, that's kind of my initial thought on that. I just want to go back to the, the last point though and, and make you know, a really, really firm position here that transparency is absolutely necessary uh, when talking about norms of behavior. And I think, you know, most of our panelists here agreed on that and, and it came up in, uh, over and over and time again to make sure we're preventing any misperceptions and miscommunications on things. And what Carr even pointed out in, in his note there that, you know, bring proof and proof requires, you know, that verification and transparency side of things. So sorry to mix those No, no, questions. no, no, it's all, it's all good. We're, we're one big happy family here, Charity. It's all good, yeah, yeah. Any, anybody else, any, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Jenny. It's just that uh, since uh, Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty gives this right uh, the, of the freedom of, of exploration and use of outer space, so if, I, I'm not so familiar with that concept, but if uh, such concept would restrict that right, of course, that should be reviewed uh, in, in the light of, of this right that is given um, in the Outer Space Treaty to the, the freedom. So uh, like any, there's been discussions on, on taxation regimes, for example. So these should be reviewed with uh, in, in the light of, of, of this freedom that's granted in, in, in the Outer Space Treaty. Yes, Thomas, thank you. I, I think, yeah, I fully agree. But I think on the other hand, I mean, Marie Ben came up with a good case, you know. I mean, we have simply because of physics, we, we are at the state where we have to coordinate frequencies, for example. As simple as that, you know, if, if, if two satellites use the same frequency, well, there's a mess. So we do that, despite of that freedom, which is uh, guaranteed in the uh, Outer Space Treaty. We do the same thing to a certain extent with slots in GEO. Of course, we do not prevent anybody to go there, but we came up with that norm, let's say that, okay, we agree we have slots of tenths of a degree. At the UN, of course, we still have the big debate, as, as, as you may know, uh, who really owns that uh, part in space and so on and so forth. So it's, it's not so easy from a legal point of view, but at least from a practical point of view, we came up with something which is until now at least, let's say, working well. And I think with that capacity discussion, we, we need to come forward with that as soon as possible because I mean, with current technologies, there will be a maximum capacity of 10,000 satellites within the shell of 100 kilometers, let's say. And if anybody gets the 10,000 licenses to, fit, to fill that shell, that shell is going to be filled for the next 50 years or whatever. And it's going to have an impact on the freedom of anybody else who wants to use that shell or some other, you know, who has to cross that shell, whatever. It's giving us a huge burden in terms of doing the traffic management, doing the space surveillance and so on and so forth, which is not necessarily shared with, you know, the operator or the owner of, uh, of these 10,000 satellites. Just to give you an example, and I think it's really timely that we talk about how, how we 
you know, allocate space to different users. Even if the outer space treaty is giving us all the freedom, I know. <laughs> I, I just yes, want yes. I just had a question for Thomas though. Do you feel that ITU should be stepping up here because they do their radio frequency I, coordination? I feel I feel that it's not necessarily the ITU perhaps, but I feel that a UN organization by the end of the day is is the right thing probably. And we have uh, the ITU is a good example. We have some other uh, UN organizations which are doing a good job. You know, I often hear, hey, UN, no, 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 that's that's a bunch of bureaucrats. Nothing happens, uh, you know. But if you look at some of these organizations, they're absolutely efficient uh, and, and sometimes even used as good examples by people who don't know, oh, oh, oh that's a UN organization. You know? <laughs> so now I think that's the only way uh, that we need an international organization and, and the UN, not, not necessarily ITU, because we need to really include all the actors, everybody, and that's only possible. Right now, I mean, by having a top-down and bottom-up, you know, effort at the same time. That's great, Thomas. Jenny, you, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to comment back to Thomas. I, I, I didn't want to sound as if I was somehow saying that I'm not appreciative of the uh, how the factual situation is and, and that, yes, we should do something about it, merely just pointing out that there is this freedom that we have to take into account and exactly to agree at the level at the multilateral international level, what to do with it. And uh, I, I, I fully appreciate what you just said about that, that importance of that discussion, both at the international states, intergovernmental level, but as well uh, with the, all the actors, including the companies and including the nation states. So um, just to, to put that straight, that uh, I wasn't <laughs> against uh, uh, that proposal. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I want to bring, so Christian Yu is in the audience. I'd like to bring Christian Yu, ask, he, Christian Yu has asked lots of questions. So why don't, we, why don't you ask one of them? Okay. He's on. Hello. I hope you can hear me. Well, uh, uh, barely. If you can like uh, use your outside voice, that'd be appreciated. Really? Just, just, just a sec. That's right. Um, yeah. Is it better that way? This is better. I can hear you better. Okay. Okay. So, so my question was, we are discussing for some time already uh, that we are close to, to a Kessler syndrome, that we are close to an overpopulating of orbits. And I mean, I, myself, I've, I've been following this discussion for some time. And I have the feeling we're ending up in the same problem like in ecology or climate. We're talking about something like it's five minutes to, to 12. And, and it's a critical situation. And still we, we, we have now uh, part of the uh, mega, uh, of, the, of, the, of the new space mega constellations up there. Uh, and still we are relaunching more and more and more. And the question is, uh, how far are we really away from the big crash? How overpopulated are the orbits? So it's a little bit also in the direction of saying how, how much capacity do we have and how much of that do we already use? or did we possibly already create the foundations of the catastrophic events of the of the next decade now? Uh, is, is there a way back? <laughs> yeah, I, so I, I appreciate uh, I appreciate where you're going with this. Um, bef before I open it up to other people, I can I can here's my here's my opinion of that stuff, man. Um, we don't know. We haven't quantified what the carrying capacity is. We don't know which orbital regimes may already be saturated in terms of their carrying capacity. Um, we first need to kind of agree on what, how to define this sort of thing, how to measure it. It needs to be a measurable kind of thing. It needs to be, uh, have probably some sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, index of sorts, uh, right? That has all sorts of things kind of feeding into it. But I think that we may be um, very, very surprised that some orbits based on our definition may already have uh, gotten to that saturation uh, 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 point. And I guess I'm, I hear the whole Kessler thing come up. I'm, I'm less of trying to focus on what Don Kessler said uh, and more on this idea of the carrying capacity. Cause I think that that's something that's inarguable. 
um, and, and, and something that, that can be saturated. And my own, my own kind of um, way to think about it is whenever our, whenever our decisions and actions can no longer prevent loss, disruption, degradation of services and capabilities above some threshold per uh, year or per month, I think by pragmatically, the carrying capacity has been exceeded uh, for that orbit. And I think Thomas talked a little bit about it in terms of uh, all these things going up into, into orbit. The other thing that I want to say that really um, disturbs me, right, is that um, based on my own scientific experiences, uh, I find that when left alone, Mother Nature seeks equilibrium. And, and, and um, you know, we don't even know what equilibrium looks like in uh, near Earth orbital space, because every few weeks we're putting 60 plus satellites and we're not allowing the ecosystem to provide us a feedback mechanism to even understand what equilibrium means. So in my opinion, we're doing things that are legal, but, but we're operating way out in front of the headlights of understanding the unintended consequences of our actions when it comes to near Earth orbital space. So I'm very concerned, uh, Christian. Thanks for the question. I guess I'd open it up to anybody here on the panel that wants to kind of address uh, what Christian brought up. Yeah. Regina? Yes, yeah, so um, thanks for the question. I think um, I'm, I'm going to link it back to another question that you asked, which I think is uh, amazing. You asked, um, is uncertainty normal? And um, we don't know for sure at the moment if we if we uh, go on the way we do it will be normal because uh, um, on the one hand of course you can um, compare orbit to an ecosystem i think that's a really really interesting idea understanding how much this system can take another way um, would be to look at it from a complex system perspective also that came up today already you know are we creating something that's so complex that we don't understand anymore let alone we uh, are we able to control this um, it's beginning to be very opaque, not just in total because we can't see everything because uh, we don't yet have the capability to to see all of it. And even if we were able to see everything, would we be able to to mitigate and 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 control it? And I think um, what what I'm, I'm not necessarily optimistic, but what uh, I think is um, at least uh, what we can at least report at the moment is. Um, that we uh, that the, the the topic is certainly increasing in awareness. I think um, because uh, more people are uh, in the public at large, but also in, in in all the different actors that are involved in, in industry and in, in the scientific um, domain, and also of course in, in st uh, for state actors on the civilian and the military side, they are beginning to come together. Um, um, build SSA capabilities, try to figure out how to talk to each other, um, you know, set, uh, set up rules uh, or begin to uh, talk about rules, uh, new rules in, in more detail. So I think there is some, there's maybe a path of optimism, but I think it's, it's, it's right to ask the question of whether we're creating something that we cannot uh, deal with. And uh, maybe at some point it will be too late to uh, make any meaningful changes. It's a very good question. O-Analytics specializes in detection and pattern of life behavior analysis to enable new intelligence to be put into action sooner. Our Delta products and services address computational bottlenecks with a reduction of data and time required for detection and to train space object recognition models. This means shorter machine learning and artificial intelligence development timelines, cycles, and related processes. Our approach incorporates elements from biometrics and physics to speed up our neural networks, in some cases making them twice as fast, using up to 50% fewer looks and 35% less frame data. We apply tried and true principles that answer questions about animate objects in the biometric realm, such as who is it to inanimate objects in the space arena to answer the operator's questions of what is it, what is it doing, and what is it likely to do next. Moreover, rather than relying solely on machine learning and artificial intelligence that can consume all seven OSI layers, we leverage lower-level machine computing and data manipulation as we consider fundamental motion principles. The yield is faster results, fewer computing resources while maintaining high accuracy. Either or, a combination of our installations could run at a sensor data collection point, ground station processing center, or during post-processing as an integral part of missions with space object detection and tracking components. 
Contact our tech team for more information about Delta and to learn of other ways O-Analytics continues on our mission of timely analytical solutions to multi-sensor data fusion challenges. So we're going to move on and we're going to bring on Angela. How about Angela Mathis? Unmute. Angela's Hi. on. Hello, hello, hello. Hey. Uh, hello from Edinburgh. <laughs> Hi, back. Yeah, so, you know, humanity's pretty smart. We were talking about uncertainty. It's an, I mean, it is a brilliant, but I was thinking uncertainty as in the uncertainties of reality. And this is as a physicist or as a mathematician. So we deal with the uncertainties in situation. That's what engineers do. That's what the human task is. That's why we all do science and engineering, right? So we have a lot of, you know, situation awareness systems, if we can get the data. So I suppose that there's a question in here for you as well. We need the data, we need the appropriate data. We need to study the mechanisms, the, the, um, the, uh, the abnormalities, the, the unexpected, the emergent behaviors, if there are any, you know, is there a finite number of things that can happen? And if not, we do have, right? I mean, what, what, where would a situation awareness, intelligent system, call it dynamic updating system that is taking the data that's being, that's coming from, you know, coming from whatever you're pointing at the sky, whether it's a, an optical or a radar system. And, uh, and, and, and would that system go some ways to give us, to give us the technology, to give us a technology stack, to give us a capability to track and to, um, to track and to predict those orbits and therefore Give us a give us some means to work with in order to start to regulate and set some of these uh, these questions that you've been asking. So, where are the sticking points? Is my question. What 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 doesn't what's not available now, which would be really really hard. But are some of these technologies which we're in within the grasp of humanity? Can we use them to to tackle this problem, and therefore you know get on with the bit of of legislating? That's my question. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Please, I want, I definitely want to see somebody try to answer this. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Thomas. Yeah, I mean, a very good point. Very good point. You know, I mean, do we have all these means? Do we have all the information uh, we need? Uh, first of all, I would say we have a lot of information, but um, we, we, I don't think we are exploiting all that information in the right way so everybody has his own information you know we have an ssa system here we have another one in in europe we we have scientists doing some uh, you know maintaining some networks uh, coming up with their opinions about what's out there uh, but i think uh, i can give you good cases you know i mean there were uh, in, in the past two years, there were a few uh, breakups, which, which come up once in a while, pretty often, by the way, which were for a long time not seen by some of the uh, of the um, traditional tracking systems for many different reasons. If you compare, you know, the orbit provided by uh, some one, let's say. SSD operator with the orbit from another operator, you would see, oops, they're way different. So what should I believe? So we are not really taking advantage of all that data we are, we are acquiring. We are not using all the information about uncertainty and so on and so forth. That's one point. And the other point is, I think the, the form question was about, is that similar with, with our climate discussion? And, and I think it's very much similar because we are talking about also, you know, long-term behavior of this environment. So what's going to be, what's going to happen in, in 10 years, in 50 years, you know, as a scientist, I'm worried about the long-term sustainability, not even talking about what's sustainable. I mean, what can we afford? Which risk can we afford to call it still sustainable? The same, you know, thing like here, can we afford two degrees Celsius uh, by the next century, warm up, uh, things like that. It's, it's all about what we as a society are willing to accept on one hand. And the other hand is what are, about all these models? You know, I mean, I have my model. My colleagues in the States have their model. The Russians have their models. And 
you know, it's like in the climate discussion, you can believe the model or not. Uh, that, that's the other aspect, uh, which makes it very much similar to the climate discussion. And of course, each of us has its own, you know, agenda. I mean, I want to make that thing sustainable. I mean, some others want to make money, some others want to make whatever. So uh, we all have our own arguments. Uh, so I think it, it is very much like that. The data is a big issue, but also the models. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, Charity? Um, I just want to say, I completely agree. We, we need to understand the models. We need to, um, you know, cross-border data sharing. Um, we need to have, you know, regulatory processes and pressure. But the problem is what is going to happen from today until, say, a year from now? How can we accelerate these efforts and, and ensure that there's not a disaster tomorrow or today? That's what I'm really worried about, that there's a lack of urgency. Um, I, I know we're all thinking about this problem. We're talking about it. We're, we're uh, studying it. Uh, I want to know what's practical for operators to do in the next month. If their satellite's in orbit today, or if they're about to launch their satellite, or if they're in the design phase, what practical items can we provide to all operators so we at least have some patch work uh, uh, to, to get to them uh, before it's too late and there's a you know an English saying perfect cannot be the enemy of the good here and and I'd really compel people you know not look for utopian uh, solutions here but we're going to have to come to some sort of uh, agreement to you know come together to make sure the, the environment's sustainable. That resonates yep. a lot with the bottom-up top-down uh, approach that, that Thomas mentioned. You know, there's things that we already do. Yes, they're not perfect. Yes, they're, they're patched together. Then like a bricolage of different things. And then there's, you know, these beautiful rules that we come to after, you know, years and years of, of, of census making. And maybe the, the two shall meet uh, at some point, but uh, that's that's what we can do at the, at the moment, um, barring, uh, cut and everything. I think someone in, in the question asked, you know, what, should we stop uh, launching altogether? I mean, this uh, uh, is something, you know, a question that we uh, we can we can entertain, but that's uh, it's uh, it's probably not going to happen right now. And uh, that resonates a lot with other with other systems that we're looking at in the earth. Yeah, climate change, uh, maybe nuclear waste, all kinds of uh, aspects where all of us maybe want to keep this setting uh, the system. Um, maybe not pristine, but we want to keep it workable and, and functional. But the question is always, what am I prepared to give up and what we're collectively prepared to give up uh, for that? Absolutely. Uh, I want to give Pedro an opportunity to get back on stage. Looks like Pedro sorted himself out. So Pedro, here's your, here's your last chance, buddy. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Now, yes. Terrific. Sorry for the tech difficulties. Um, no worries. I, it, it occurs to me that, you know, insurance carriers uh, really drive uh, the modification of behavior here in a terrestrial sense. So someone earlier mentioned speed limits and speedometers and seat belts. You know, all that is driven by insurance carriers. And, uh, you know, there are some very powerful companies that insure the spacecraft that are on orbit. In fact, they don't even uh, insure the vehicle until it gets off the launch pad. So they have a lot of stake. We're talking about millions and millions and probably billions of dollars in claims that uh, they could realistically be on the hook for if we start seeing some of these collisions. So I wonder um, about the value of bringing some of those folks into the conversation, really having an understanding that they really have a lot of stake. I mean, we're talking real, real money uh, that's at stake. Yeah, so I, I appreciate the question. Before I let uh, other uh, folks hear, here's what I can tell you from my experience, right? I've spoken to a few of these space insurers. Uh, all of them would love to have, you know, the science that can show causality between anomalies and that sort of stuff and, uh, you know, li you know li liable uh you know, liable entities, right? So it's like, okay, object one, two, three had this failure or whatever, and these people filed the claim. Um, I can show that there is a non-zero probability that, you know, this object or this thing uh, 
was, you know, at least in part responsible for that. So space insurers would love that. Let me tell you what they, they, they don't love, wanting to invest in any of the science that would actually help them underwrite that sort of stuff. So every single space insurer that I've spoken to, and I say, hey, I'm not asking for millions of dollars, just come together and maybe help fund the science that could help you actually make more money, and they won't do it. So, so, so I, have, I have a love-hate relationship with space insurers. Anyway, I'm gonna open it up to other folks here. Any, any of the panelists want to? Okay, Thomas. Uh, yeah, I have the same experience with, with big ones. So no, like Swiss Re. The point is simply, and I think it's, it's similar to the climate discussion, as long as we don't see, you know, dozens of cases where, for example, because of space debris, they have to pay, you know, they, they will just tell you, hey, our biggest risk is launch, technical failures, blah, blah, blah. We have done our homework. We don't see that collisions with space debris are our biggest problem. I mean, watching it. Um, you know, it was the same with the climate discussion. Unless they could be convinced, hey, these hurricanes and, on, and so on, it's giving you a headache and it's because of climate uh, change. Uh, Unless we can prove that this is really increasing the risk and, and uh, impacting their market, they will not invest in that. I mean, once they see the point, they will probably even, you know, rise, rise the prices for the ones who are not, you know, proofing or not bringing their, their uh, assets back, for example. So now if, if you don't do a good job in keeping the environment clean, you have to pay. I mean, it's like you know, it's like uh, if you have an insurance uh, for a car, if you do some things, if you're not wearing your seatbelt, okay, they're not going to pay. But we're not there by far not because they are telling you, mm, we don't see that this is really our biggest risk. Right. Um, um, yeah, Charity? Yeah, yeah, just uh, quickly. Um, there's a couple uh, influences into this that I don't think we talked about, you know, are operators required to have insurance, for example, their party liability. Some nations require it, others don't, a lot don't, in fact. Uh, in fact, the, the nation, our Outer Space Treaty, uh, the nation is ultimately liable for their private actors' uh, activities. So uh, the buck stops with the government that allows the launch. And some governments require indemnification and others don't. So there's a couple key inputs here um, and, uh, you know, maybe Jenny has something to say about like, you know, being legally vetted, a third party liability claim uh, has something like that been vetted in a court of law before. A couple years ago, um, Swiss RE, they had a really, really good um, document that they put out and they went through a scenario of what would happen if two objects, uh, private operators collided or, or, or a claim was made. And they anticipated it would just go to a civil lawsuit. And I just found that so fascinating. Um, you know, the body of law isn't quite there yet. Uh, insurance isn't absolutely required uh, across the board. Demonification is not a thing globally yet. So there's a lot more here to this discussion and I think we should continue to advance it. Excellent. Um, I would like to, um... I guess bring bring on Kerry Christensen uh, as a last person to just uh, if Kerry has anything to say or bring bring to the table, uh, this is your chance. I think she left already. I oh, can't did she find her? Yeah. All right. Sorry. All right. Well, 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 we'll 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 appreciate. Oh, Kerry. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry, my bad. No, it's all right. Ah, Carrie. Okay, now now I feel Pedro's uh, pain, so to speak. Okay. <laughs> On the uh, unmute, <laughs> too many windows. Um, thanks for the pop quiz, Mariba. No, this has been uh, fascinating. And as Mariba knows and Charity, who may remember a meeting at a Women in Aerospace uh, years ago, what I love about these conversations and the way most of you present is I 
not an engineer or an astro anything, um, find this all very uh, digestible. And my comment that I put in the wrong place, I guess, under questions, um, just at the start of this, when you were uh, comparing this to, to the, the literally global expanse of, of different reactions to um, medical, political, what have you, reactions to the way people react um, with uh, the pandemic, I think is just a brilliant way to, to make this um, even more digestible for, for people even more greatly removed from um, the, the aerospace or aeronautical space community. Um, I work alongside you brilliant folks. So it's been a fabulous uh, <laughs> education <laughs> by osmosis and, <laughs> and conference attending. Um, but just it's something just, it just rung uh, so, so, so true just in the, the early part of this, this talk. And um, I also, um, to dovetail, I was trying to dovetail on, on Pedro's question about insurance, and this might be a very American perspective. Um, for better or worse, uh, I think the U.S. is probably the most litigious country. Um, I could be wrong. Again, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I'm dealing with an English major here. Uh, and I'd be curious to, know, to, to, to watch and listen as we go on to, uh, to see how that necessary evil is involved without uh, completely uh, overtaking the, the direction or the decisions uh, that that uh, you good folks will will have to be making. So uh, there's my cool. half-nated rambling input. But uh, oh, thank you all. Yeah. It was just uh, I you know I've been loving the space cafes and um, this one uh, this one might be the uh, might be number one. And you're up against Claudia Kessler who spoke on Tuesday. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank, thank you very much, Carrie. Appreciate uh, your input and, and contribution and comments. And so with that, uh, our, our time is kind of uh, up here. Uh, so, but, but, so what I wanna do now is I wanna give everybody, uh, all of our panelists uh, time for some closing statements or thoughts uh, with, with this uh, second session of, of Space Cafe's Morbus Vox Populi. So let's start with, uh, yeah, Charity. Um, okay, closing statements. Um, yeah. Well, first, <laughs> thank you. This is a really important dialogue. We should keep talking and we should actually formulate uh, actions out of these sort of uh, discussions. Um, I, I have some norms to offer people if you want to hear some. Um, and, and they're kind of, you know, blue sky stuff, but like, let's, let's put them out here. Prepare for the unexpected. Um, so as you design your spacecraft, should an enormous anomaly occur, um, and it cannot deorbit under its own power. So prepare for that. That's going to be an eventuality. End of life of a, of a like an, uh, satellite is still part of the life cycle. Uh, see, be seen, and be warned. Make sure your spacecraft can be tracked, is being tracked, and can be uniquely identified, OK? Until end of disposal, again, and have a process for conjunction warning and assessments. Um, Site the orbit. This is a no-brainer. Uh, certain orbits have larger populations of debris and others are becoming more congested. So take that into consideration. And I'll just um, do two more. I have a list of 10 here. Be maneuverable, you know, if you can. Uh, use propulsion or other techniques to avoid collision with trackable objects. Uh, and, and last but certainly not least, I have others. Uh, be choosy. You, you can be part of the economic pressure to push this industry into a more sustainable uh, formula. So choose suppliers, launch providers that commit to safe space practices. Um, and if you, anyone wants to talk to me about more of these uh, offerings or norms, uh, come talk to me. Thanks. Thanks, Charity. Jenny? Hi, thanks. Um, so I think, I mean, just Going back to, to what was discussed here about uh, the ways how to deal with this to, from uh, top down and bottom up, and I think this is what we are currently doing. 
at all levels, at different paces, with different instruments, with different kind of norms, this legally binding and non-legally binding, I think we need all. And this is a fact that we have uh, currently. But of course, this also creates certain issues that we have to be mindful that uh, having this uh, plurality of all these norms, it also creates some uncertainties that which ones are applicable, how do they work, which ones are enforceable, which ones are not. And, and uh, we should somehow try to deal with that with the object in mind so that where do we want to go with all these norms? We want to have a sustainable and safe uh, space environment. And that should be the goal of all these norms. If they all point to the same direction, that's great. And if we can all live with all that uh, at the same time, perfect. But I think we have to just consider, have a conscious uh, a discussion and, and understanding what all of these are and, and whether all of them are useful, whether we need new ones, or can we live with the existing ones. So just um, I think we we all trying to do uh, uh, the, the same and, and trying to go to the si same direction. So let's try to fix the legal side as well uh, in that respect. Thank you, Jenny. Regina? Yeah, I'd, I'd uh, pick up on, on Jenny's point on, you know, also involved the legal side and I'd, I'd scale it up to um, we need to talk to everyone. There's lots of different disciplines and lots of different actors involved in that um, entire discussion. Um, we're creating something so complex um, that we don't yet have a way to handle. We don't understand it. It's similar to automation. You know, you create something, sometimes even the designer doesn't have the idea anymore on how exactly it works. And that will be exacerbated by um, the, the huge increase in different actors and, and different capable systems that we have. And, this complexity, if we want to um, keep it somehow um, manageable and resilient, uh, which means that we bounce back from the inevitable um, uh, failures and uh, little uh, incidents that we will have and that we will see if we want to bounce back from this and make the system uh, stronger, then we need to, we need to uh, operate and talk together. And that means on, uh, um, in, within professional organization, that means on the national side between different actors involved who have any kind of stake in the domain, whether they're from the scientific field, from industry, from civilian or, or military um, and security uh, sites. And that will be scaled up to um, um, talking to um, lots of different actors in multilateral fora. Thank you. And my brother, Thomas, bring it on home, brother. Uh, yeah, thanks, Marita. I mean, a lot of what I would have said has already been said by uh, <laughs> the panel here. I think it's, it's absolutely important to realize that it, it's not easy. There is no single truth, uh, you know, starting with uh, what we observe, starting with uh, the models. Uh, there's a lot of opinions out there and, and we have to make sure that we, we kind of fuse all of that. And there is also no single, you know, single way of how we are coming up with norms. I, I have been talking about cultures. Cultures are different. And I have been really, I had the uh, opportunity to work with many different colleagues from, you know, from Asia, from Russia, from the United States, from Australia. And cultures are different. And it is all about, you know, being enough transparent to build up the trust uh, uh, that, you know, we can collaborate. And when I say all the actors, it's not just in one country, you know, private actors, state actors, uh, other ones, but it's really about, uh, you know, having a really a multilateral discussion here. We, we need that multilateral discussion. It's not going to be easy, we know. I mean, I have been in Vienna so many times. I know really it's, it's difficult. Jenny knows, uh, uh, many of you know. <laughs> uh, so, but I'm deeply convinced that we need the bottom-up uh, approach uh, where we have kind of, you know, an open discussion. Uh, we, we have good examples in, in other domains. I mean, on sea, on air, in air, and in, in you know, the Antarctic Treaty, for example, we have really good example where this worked. And it only worked because we, we made things more and more transparent, despite of all our, you know, understandable uh, security uh, 
requirements we, we all have, but we, we, we have to make that uh, more and more transparent. And when you look today, you know, I mean, I still remember the days when topographic maps were secret. Good topographic maps were highly secret. We are living in a different world. And I'm, I'm sure this is going to happen and has to happen for outer space as well. Without compromising, you know, the, the, the security uh, needs of the, the individual uh, nations, I, I'm sure we, we have to come to another level. And that needs multilateral discussions. I repeat that at the UN, uh, perhaps a UN organization uh, starting uh, coordinating that. This is, at least this is my vision <laughs> as, a, let's say, as a scientist, but also involved in these political uh, and legal discussions. Thanks a lot, Mariba, for uh, giving me the opportunity. <laughs> and thanks a lot for all, all the other colleagues here on the panel. It was a great, it was a great time. Yeah, no, th thank you all uh, so much. Um, I want to um, clearly thank uh, Space Watch uh, Global for 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 um, um, you know basically hosting uh, you know the Space Cafe Morbus Vox Populi. I want to uh, let people know that this doesn't happen without sponsorship and i know that torsten and, and will 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 underscore this but uh my personal thanks uh to dr stacy jones and o analytics for uh sponsoring this uh second session of uh morbus vox Populi. so uh over to you torsten great i thought you will mention your next uh your next session um so we are planning to have the third edition or third session of morbus vox Populi on the 11th of february next year as you can see so pin that in your calendar already so and if you have some ideas for for good content that you would like to hear to discuss with us are also some specialists you want to see sh sh or fire it out to us and i mean when i made the advertisement for the for the session today i uh, announced it with the next level of webinars and i hope uh, we could fulfill that and you felt engaged and you are you got also something out of it so um let's talk what what is up on our plate for this year uh so we don't stop here uh, with the space cafe today because the year is not over next week i will speak to the fantastic professor uh, stefan hober about the future design of the legal order of human activities in outer space uh, i know it's it's a very hot topic and i mean it follows the line what we discussed uh, today and if you don't know Stefan uh, so far you should um, join this, this discussion because Stefan is a lawyer but Stefan um, is not shy to say his truth about his interpretation of, of law what is great um, and on in, in a week from now so on the 10th of December we will launch our first Space Cafe Summit Anarchy in Space that will be a top level discussion together with my editor in chief, Markus Peyer and uh, Professor Arkayo Vosrogel and Dorina Antoni about the handbook for space security. Again, it follows the same line we discussed here today um, and we will dig into our, a few of the chapters of the book. And on 15th of December, which will be Mark also the last Space Cafe this year, um, I will talk with Martin Coleman about space debris and his vision what happened in 2020 so far so then we will take a quick break or till the 5th of january and then we will continue our space cafes because we start to love it uh, and i hope so you do um all events are on eventbrite uh, online already and as always we would like to hear your feedback so please check in with us on twitter on facebook on linkedin send a pitch in or postcard so don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-weekly newsletters and if you treat yourself with something special become a space watcher today you see this cool t-shirt moriba is, is wearing uh we have more of these t-shirts available for all of you so please uh, check in on our fan shop take your credit cards and go to shop.spacewatch.global and i know i repeat myself but we really need your support to keep on doing what we do and our uh, did i mention it will be cyber week or we have still cyber week so let's make the best out, best out of that and 
As Moriba said, the Space Cafes are up for sponsorship as well. And for this edition, again, also from my, my side, big thank to Dr. Stacy Jones and OL Analytics for their support. Um, thank you all very much for your interest today. And our thanks to Moriba, to Regina, to Jenny, Charity and Thomas for this exciting conversation. I mean, I'm not in the active position today, just a technical hand. I had the pleasure to really enjoy and lean back and, and listen to your answers and it was great. And thanks again to the entire team behind the scenes for, t for doing this great job twice, week by week again. And I hope you all would stay safe and healthy and thanks for joining us today. And hope to see you next week. In the meantime, follow our website or us on social media and don't forget, become a space watcher just to show that i have of course a space watcher shirt as well good that's it from our end take care bye bye thank you very hey, much all of you th thanks everybody so so much uh appreciate it yeah you might you might get some questions by the way so <laughs> <laughs> yeah to to all your panelists uh we will share this question that were not answered today um with you or um, i hope in the next hour so let's see how fast i can uh, dig them out and then to see that we get your answers or to the audience back. Thank you very much. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Ciao. Mm -hmm.